Hello, everyone. We're just going to wait for the webinar to populate. Uh, it'll take about 30 seconds and then we'll, we'll start the discussion. So just a few seconds of waiting. Hey everyone, just 15 seconds more or so. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Zed Adams, the chair of the philosophy department here at the New School for Social Research. I'm very happy to be welcoming you to another installment of our summer talk series here at the NSSR. We've titled the series, The Current Moment, Perspectives from the Social Sciences and the Humanities. The series was conceived by myself and Robert Kosteva, the vice dean here at the NSSR, with the following thought. There are plenty of places you can go for answers to questions that you already have, but a university is a place you can go to make yourself uh, aware of questions you don't already have and be provided with the tools for answering them. I'm joined here today by two people, Miranda Young, my co-host. Miranda is a, a PhD student in the philosophy department here at the New School, and she's gonna help us uh, field the questions. And our main attraction, Diva Woodley, uh, Associate Professor of Politics here at the New School for Social uh, Research. One of the true delights of working on this series has been the chance it's given me to read some of the work of my colleagues. And I will say that in Diva's case, that's especially true. I highly recommend her book, The Politics of Common Sense, How Social Movements Use Public Discourse to Change Politics and Win Acceptance, <clears throat> published by Oxford. One very interesting question that uh, Diva's book raises is whether it's possible for a social movement to change public policy without changing people's attitudes that that movement uh, or the group uh, motivating it, uh, advocating it represents. And she argues that it is possible that by reframing the debate surrounding that movement, there can be genuine substantive public policy changes, even as you see people's attitudes remain the same. And that was really an eye opener and illuminating to me to read. She points to the legalization of gay marriage as a particularly salient example of this. So, so again, I highly recommend her book. Um, today, Diva's going to be giving us a talk titled The Politics of Care. Thanks so much for joining us today, Diva. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Um, and hello and welcome to all of you out there. Um, so let me begin with kind of the story of how I started to um, write about the current moment. Um, one is that I'm a scholar of social movements, so um, social movements always draw my attention, uh, but I'm also a scholar of public discourse, and I had already planned to write a book on economic discourse, um, and I was in the process of writing that book when um, the first set of uprisings um, in the movement before the advent of the movement for Black Lives um, happened in Ferguson, Missouri. And I found myself um, studying uh, that movement and writing about it in lieu of writing, working on the book that I was already supposed to be working on. Um, and the reasons that I did that were manifold, right? One, uh, because um, this movement is close to me. It's close to me personally. Um, it, it is, uh, you know, um, the, the revival of a black liberation movement but it's also about safety and care in a way that's very personal. Um, uh, I'm a black woman. I am the mother of black children and um, the wife of a black man. And uh, it really mattered to me um, what was going on um, uh, you know, in the country around this, um, in addition to the scholarly part of me that was really taken with what I saw to be the genius of the movement. Um, so I started writing this book, um, which is forthcoming, called Black Lives Matter and the Democratic Necessity of Social Movements. Um, 
So today I want to talk to you about the political philosophy of the movement, uh, because that political philosophy is very relevant in these times, not only because we are in a moment of uprising, and indeed the biggest civil rights uprising that we have ever seen um, in the American context, um, and also in the global context, right? This is a, um, a transnational movement. Um, but also in the um, situation that we're in, in terms of the global pandemic, right, of the COVID pandemic. And I think that the political philosophy of the movement um, really offers us a place to go in terms of thinking through how we move through both of these moments and get out the other side um, in a way um, that will improve all of our lives. Okay, so um, I characterize the political philosophy of the movement as uh, radical black feminist pragmatism. Um, and that's because the black feminist principles of the movement, which everyone in the movement will tell you that bedrock ideology is black feminism, um, but those principles are both radical and pragmatic. Um, and people, those two terms don't usually go together, um, but this movement is able to um, create a confluence between those two things by both using its radical political imagination um, in terms of the scope of the work that they envision um, and the world that they're able to imagine um, along with pragmatic and concrete political steps to get from here to there, okay? Now, one of the key elements of radical Black feminist pragmatism is the politics of care. There are other elements um, uh, that I talk about in my book, but today I want to talk about the politics of care. So, um, the politics of care as practiced in uh, the Movement for Black Lives, and I should say, just for those who don't know, the Movement for Black Lives is the name of an umbrella organization um, that consists of dozens of organizations and individuals um, who are doing work for Black liberation in a variety of different topical areas. Okay, so it's an umbrella term. It's not, you know, it's not separate from Black Lives, it, it is um, separate from Black Lives Matter Global Network, BYP 100, Dream Defenders, but they all sort of, um, congregate under this rubric, okay? Um, okay, so the politics of care as practiced in the movement for Black Lives is characterized by an acknowledgement of trauma and a commitment to healing, an understanding of interdependence as a plain fact, um, an unapologetic Blackness, a defense of Black joy, an insistence on accountability, and an abolitionist perspective that favors restorative justice um, that to deal with, to prevent and deal with harm um, that focuses on repair rather than punishment, okay? One of the main ways that the politics of care is enacted is through the practice of healing justice. And this is a phrase that kind of comes from um, the disability disability justice movement, um, but is widely practiced across several different movements at this moment, right? The environmental justice movement is also interested in healing justice. Okay, so healing justice is a mode of analysis and action that acknowledges that oppression causes harm that is more than distributional, instrumental, or infrastructural, and that addressing that harm requires both personal and political action toward care. Okay, so this is really important and it's really unique about this movement is that this movement um, takes into account the idea that the, the problem with oppression is not only instrumental, it's not only a question of rights, um, it's not only a question of material deprivation, it actually causes us psychological and bodily harm and that that has to be a part of what we take into account as we, um, you know, mobilize in movements, right, as we mobilize to fight um, that oppression, but also um, as we think about solutions, right? Okay. Importantly, a healing justice perspective takes participation in collective action for social change to be an essential part of the process of healing because it is only through such activity that we can change the conditions of oppression. The context in which much of our trauma occurs and in which it will be reproduced unless we can mitigate or eradicate its causes. 
This approach is a radical one because its logic springs from the observation that it is impossible to resolve our socially and politically produced traumas, to heal ourselves from the damage of collective and systemic ills while only focusing on internal processes, okay? This is really critical because the political philosophy of the Movement for Black Lives is um, one that has structural analysis at its center, okay? Now, structural analysis um, is usually something that we use to think about class analyses in particular. And there are class analyses in the, in the political philosophy of the Movement for Black Lives, but we're talking about structural analysis in general. And so the politics of care is about structural care, right? Um, not only about personal care. So it's really different than the kind of popular calls toward kind of um, thinking about mindfulness or wellness, right? Or work-life balance um, that um, have become um, so culturally popular uh, in the last um, you know, decade. Um, not that it doesn't incorporate those things, it does. It's only, um, the thing that's really important about it is that it does not put on the individual, right, um, the responsibility to heal themselves from social ills, right? Social ills have to be healed through social action, okay? Okay, so while individual therapy, self-work, and transformation are important, because radical Black feminist pragmatism understands individuals to be always in context, the philosophy prescribes social and political change as a part of the cure for what ails those who live under structural, oppressive structural conditions. Um, okay, I argue that the, this care, right, is not only an ethic, but actually a politics, right? Not just an ethics or a moral, but actually a politics, because in the movements, um, care is an essential activity of governance based on the acknowledgement of the basic need for and responsibility to provide um, care that is always required for human life and therefore must be attended to in the arrangement, management, and maintenance of society and politics, okay? The notion of care has a deep affinity with um, the voluminous literature in feminist political theory, um, particularly the work of Joan Tronto, um, uh, she, in, uh, as she articulated it in her book, Caring Democracy, um, where she talks about what it means to be a citizen in a democracy, and I'm quoting now, is to care for citizens and to care for democracy itself, okay, end quote. However, people in the movement do not center care because of a commitment to the idea of democracy or the duty and value of citizenship, but instead in accordance with the fundamental political claim animating the movement, that is, because they matter to themselves and to one another. There is no intermediary term between care and the person to legitimate the necessity of caring. There is no appeal to abstract categories to bestow significance on the bodies, minds, and spirits in need of care. People simply matter, and that is enough reason to care, okay? So let's pause to consider this. To matter, by its primary definition, is just to exist as physical substance that has mass at rest, okay? That's the physical definition. I personally, this is an aside, love physical definitions because they're deeply clarifying. So just sit with that. To matter is just to exist as a physical substance that has mass at rest. This entitles you to care, okay? But it also means to be of importance or significance, and to have content and substance that is distinct from manner or form. A matter is also an affair under consideration, the reason for distress. It can refer to the pus that seeps from a wound. One does not matter because of the way one behaves or the way one, one's form is made or appears. One does not earn the properties of substance and significance via motiv motivation or avocation. One is not bequeathed this ability to matter by right. There are explanations for the reasons that we matter, but no justification is necessary. We simply do matter, and so we deserve care. So 
Care here is not a mere sentiment, nor does it indicate a posture of deference or coddling. Instead, care hews closely to the dictionary definition. It is an, in its noun form. It means the provision of what is necessary for health, welfare, maintenance, and protection. Um, and also serious attention to doing something correctly in order to avoid unnecessary damage or risk. As a verb, it means to undertake with care, uh, to feel concern or interest in something, to attach importance to it, and to provide for the needs that one observes. In this way, the politics of care begins with the conviction that it matters when whole populations are hurting from harms inflicted by the ways that we have structured society so that some people are systematically advantaged and others are systematically disadvantaged. It matters that we have designed politics so that some voices are much more likely to be heard and have influence than others. Um, though all may be or bear an equal claim to citizenship, okay, it matters that in the United States, we have a grotesquely huge carceral system that consigns some people to not only be confined in cages, but also to what Orlando Patterson has called social death or the denial of full personhood and the mark of disposability. And so to care means to take not only the material deprivation, but the pain that accompanies these political realities seriously and to work to mitigate the causes and repair the devastating results of this lack of care. A politics of care begins with the notion that it matters if we're hurting, that we must attend to that in the conception and carrying out of our activities of governance, okay? Um, therefore, the politics of care is a reframing of the purpose, priorities, and experience of politics. It is a way of pursuing self, community, and political governance that values feelings and somatic embodiment along with what we are enabled to do in the world as it actually exists, okay? And that is what we're enabled to do socially, what we're enabled to do politically, what we're enabled to do economically, okay? In this way, the politics of care acknowledges the modes of experiencing, knowing, and doing that are most devalued in liberal, masculinist, and capitalist paradigms. It is because of these underlying values that the politics of care is, is able to acknowledge oppression as traumatic and not just um, a matter of unfairness or, or material deprivation, okay? The politics of care is able to understand interdependence to be fundamental. And this interdependence is not an aspiration. It is not um, an ethic. It is not a matter of morality. The politics of care takes interdependence to be a material fact, right? Which it is, okay? But this is something that um, it, it is not centered and is sometimes left out of um, liberal theory in general, okay? This is also why the politics of care has in it um, the practices of unapologetic blackness, which is a kind of um, rejection of respectability politics, um, not only respectability politics as it has to do black respectability politics, right, which we understand to be um, um, this idea that if we act as um, uh, um, if we act as sort of models of normative behavior, then um, people will have to give us respect, right? The Obama years taught young black people that that was not true. It did not matter how respectable you were, um, you were still um, going to be subject um, to the oppression that black people are subject to uh, regardless of class. So this um, idea of unapologetic blackness comes out of this time period, but it's also just a rejection of stigmatization and is an oper um, operationalization of the, um, the willingness and indeed the necessity of centering the most marginalized that's operating in the movement as well, right? And, this is, and we see this um, when the movement centers um, people who are, are stigmatized, right? Um, even within black communities, um, trans folks, um, incarcerated folks, people who do sex work, uh, poor people, right? Like the movement wants to put those people as its, um, at its center of concern. 
Um, and that's part of the, the unapologetic blackness. Um, and the flip side of unapologetic Blackness is a celebration of Black joy. Um, and we, we see, you know, recently there have been so many pieces of writing um, that either come out of the movement or are in affinity with the movement. Um, and one of those um, is a piece in The Atlantic um, that says that, um, you know, um, oppression is horrible, but Blackness is not, right? Um, and so the affirmation of Black joy um, and um, its importance and centrality to the phenomenology of Blackness is really important for the politics of care as well. Um, the other thing that's very central to the politics of care is an insistence um, on accountability, which is really the flip side of interdependence. Right. In order to have um, an interdependence that is just, there has to be uh, accountability. Right. We have to be able to show up for people, um, show up for ourselves in particular ways, um, um, uh, and to try to be accountable to those that we are working to build a society with. Um, and then the last thing, of course, is um, of an abolitionist perspective. Right. The politics of care um, is abolitionist, and that's because abolition is at its bottom. Um, a way of caring, right? A way of caring um, or enacting care in our society. Okay, so though we often locate the political genesis of the movement for Black lives in police shootings, a more accurate assessment of movement motivations must consider what Audre Lorde has called the institutional dehumanization that has plagued Black life um, in the Americas and globally. This dehumanization is the outcome of systems of oppression anchored in histories that stretch back even before the Atlantic slave trade. Um, this historiography is important not only because it explains the origin of anti-Black racism, but just as importantly because it explains the origin of what Cedric Robinson has called racial capitalism. Now, I don't know if you all are familiar with Cedric Robinson. If you're not, you should get familiar with him. Um, but the thing that he points out is that um, capitalism was raced and racialized even before Europeans were interacting with, um, with non-Europeans, right, very often. And in fact, raced other people on the continent of Europe in ways that allowed them um, to uh, perpetuate economic deprivation based on um, raced categories that today would not necessarily make sense to us, okay? Um, Okay, this is worth noting because it points to a new dimension of the way that the particular lived experience and the general order of things are intertwined, okay? Anti-Black racism is particular and particularly virulent, um, playing out via oppression and domination in various legal and practical uh, frameworks around the world, but it is also one example among many interlocking systems that events the tension at the heart of modernity's logic. That equality is a value to be distributed among equals and that some must be explicitly or implicitly disqualified in order for the universal to seem to exist. This tension sharpens the edge of every difference that we acknowledge as significance. Significant, and when, when I say that every difference that we acknowledge is, I just mean um, identities that, um, you know, that we uh, think of as politically relevant. And it is the logic, this logic, that gives oppression and domination its sense. That is the ability for these concepts to help us understand the ordering of the world. So what makes the political philosophy of the movement for Black Lives um, unique, radical, and resonant is that it goes after this ordering of the world, okay? Displacing debates about rights, natural or otherwise, and citizenship, um, in its literal or legal or looser polity dwelling signification and puts people and their lived experience at its center, okay? And this is really key. Um, I don't think it's an accident that these uprisings have swelled um, so much in the era of uh, COVID-19, of the global pandemic, um, for a variety of reasons. Um, one, people have the time, right, to be out protesting. Um, but also, um, what this era has shown us in the United States case um, is that um, the country has pit directly, right? Not sort of like implicitly, but 
directly has pit um, the values of care for life and health, especially of the most vulnerable, against those of profit, right? And the current governors, uh, not the actual governors, the president, the administration, right, of this nation, the governors have actually been much better about it, but they have um, decided to prioritize profit, right, over care. And so this um, question has been made very stark uh, in this moment. Um, and it has allowed people to um, understand the resonance uh, of the politics of care, which the movement for Black Lives has been talking about uh, from its inception. Um, importantly, there are also other global examples of what a politics of care um, emanating from um, executives uh, might look like. And, and for that, we can look to New Zealand and to um, Jacinda Ardern and the way that um, they have managed um, the pandemic response, right, um, in that, that case. Okay. Um, how am I doing on time? I can't see. You're good. You've got about uh, nine minutes left. Okay. All right. So under the sort of political philosophy um, that centers this politics of care, uh, oppression is no longer a problem of, or can't be caricatured as a problem of malice, bad faith, or misplaced principles or mistakes. It is instead an observable fact of some people's lives. One that must be undone, not for the sake of fairness, but because people matter and should not suffer because of society's arrangement. Now, this is really critical because though the movement for Black Lives centers Black experiences and all Black experiences, right, including the experience of um, non-respectable, right, Black people, um, it is also the case that the political philosophy gives us a blueprint for what it looks like if what you're most concerned about is, do people have what they need to live and thrive, right? Okay, so from this point of view, the chief mission of governance um, is to rearrange laws and practices, political, social, and economic, so that people do not suffer, at least not in systematic and predictable ways, because people matter and the purpose of politics um, is to assign responsibilities for care and ensure people are as capable as possible of participating in this assignment of responsibilities, okay? Um, one of the um, folks that I interviewed for the project, Nikita Mitchell, who is the former director of organizing for uh, the Black Lives Matter Global Network based in Oakland, describes um, the, the issue of trying to think through and enact the politics of care this way. She says, and I quote, a lot of the shift in our movement, looking at relationships, power dynamics, emotions, is a reaction to some of the movements of the 20th century. We are doing something magical and new. We believe that getting to a new world is not just about policy change, but it's also culture change. So most of our work is in the service of building a new community, repairing relationships and building um, new community as the basis of our power. Then I think tending to the emotions of people involved is actually necessary because of how we want to be in the future. We need to practice being now the type of community that we want in the future. So I think valuing people's full selves is extremely important, therefore, we have to be clear about our movements and put capacity towards being able to deal with people's full selves, which is a constant struggle um, at the center of thinking about what we do, close quote. Okay, so the movement and the greater polity are in the midst right now uh, of that struggle, right? And uh, key to finding a way through this struggle um, are the principles that talk about um, interdependence and, and the other kind of things that we've been talking about um, in radical Black feminist pragmatism. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about is um, the ways in which uh, the movement is abolitionist, or, or rather the way 
suggests that abolition is central to the politics of care and in fact is a political act of care um, coming from the perspective of the movement. Okay. So the final aspect of the politics of care is an abolitionist ethic. For people in movement, abolition is at bottom a politics of care. This is because though contemporary abolitionists believe in the ultimate elimination of police and prisons, that aspiration is predicated on creating the material and social conditions in which most people do not harm others. This aspiration, like the rest of the political philosophy of the movement, is pragmatic and not utopian. No abolitionist believes that the American polity is close to shutting down prisons and completely defunding police forces. Instead, they do practical political work with the aim of first changing people's minds about what motivates people to cause harm and what constitutes safety. Second, fighting for the reallocation of resources away from policing, arresting and imprisoning people and toward adequately feeding, housing, educated and finding work for people, that is caring for people, right? And third, for preventing as many people from being locked up um, uh, as possible, right? So the abolitionist position is in its most basic form quite simple. Policing, jail, and prisons do not actually perform the functions that they purport to perform, right? If you all read Miriam Kaba's recent piece in the New York Times, she says this all the time. You should also look to the work of Ruth Wilson Gilmore for a very um, lucid explanation of what abolition actually is. Um, okay, so the abolitionist position is in its most basic form, Policing, jail, and prisons do not actually perform the functions that they purport to perform. That is, keeping people safe from violence and harm. Instead, those institutions cause massive economic, political, social, and psychological harms, which are quantifiable and grossly disproportionate for Black and Brown people. They do not accept that this state of affairs, that is, abolitionists do not accept that this state of affairs, which is widely acknowledged to be damaging and unfair, is the best that society can do. This is particularly the case if your politics comes from the place of care, right? Practical care, right? Not only sort of empathetic care. Importantly, abolitionists are able to make the claim that jails and prisons do not keep us safe based on a voluminous and robust empirical literature documenting in detail the fact that the grotesque growth of the punitive penitentiary apparatus in America since the 1970s has been completely unlinked to either the rise or fall of crime rates, okay? As, as Michelle Alexander has written, the American penal system, and I'm quoting, has emerged as a system of social control unparalleled in world history. The primary targets of its control can be defined largely by race. And she goes on to say, this is an astonishing development, given that as recently as the mid 1970s, the most well respected criminologists were predicting that the prison system would soon fade away. This conclusion was reached because at the time, as we also know today, there were already ample evidence that prison did not deter crime significantly, um, that, that um, those who had meaningful economic and social opportunities were unlikely to commit crimes um, regardless of what the penalties were. And while those who went to prison were far more likely to commit crime, or, or and those who went to prison were far more likely to commit crimes in the future, okay? So abolitionists today, like criminologists in the era before the war on drugs, which um, uh, ballooned the size of the prison system, and also transformed the way that people think about crime um, and the variety of offenses that are criminal, um, uh, so abolitionists today, like criminologists before that era, posit that most people cause harm because they are already living in a context of structural harm. This harm takes the form of poverty or other material deprivation, like lack of access to health care, schooling, adequate transportation, mental health, um, housing, or sociocultural harms like discrimination, neglect, violence, or negligence. The material and sociocultural structural harms described affect individuals, but characterize whole communities and their impacts can be objectively observed. Abolitionists simply point out that these massive, long observed patterns 
have a consequence, which is lack of safety. And they posit that in order to make people safer, our, in order to make people safer in our society, we have to actually make our society safer for people. This is the way in which care is a politics. It has practical ends. It's, it's, it, it, it incorporates how we feel and how we are embodied, but it also is about how we live in the world and what is the most practical way to get us from here to a society in which we can all live and thrive. Thank you so much. Uh, it's perfect timing. So uh, just one logistical note to everybody out there. We have a couple of ways to ask questions. One is to open up, there's actually a separate Q&A window on Zoom. Zoom's got a lot of parts. Open up the Q&A window and you can type out your question and you can read other people's questions. And that might be helpful to kind of spur thinking along those lines. And then you can also go into the attendees section and raise your hand and we'll be able to call on you and you could ask your question verbally over Zoom. So either of those routes uh, works for us. So let's jump right into it. Um, I'm gonna draw upon Valerie's question um, to, to kind of start the conversation where um, I know in some of your other work, you've brought out the necessary role that you think insurrection plays in continuing the life of democracy that you know to put it bluntly democracy stagnates and we need political movements that are outside of the normal kind of political structure to rejuvenate the kind of life of citizens in society and, and so i want to ask you to say something about that and then connect it up with i think uh valerie has a very nice question about the flip side of that which is how can we use black joy to avoid activist burnout and other and what other strategies can we uh, use to avoid burnout? So there's, I take it on your view, the need for, you know, insurrection, but there's also the, you know, there's the very real burnout that comes from the kind of massive commitment that that requires. And how do you think people can cope with that? Well, I mean, people in, um, organizers in the Movement for Black Lives take this really very seriously and um, have several practices, um, somatic-based healing practices. Um, there are whole um, sort of training sessions to help people um, understand how to recognize when they're feeling burned out and how to sort of develop practices that help them avoid that um, and how to um, take care of themselves and each other um, while in the midst of um, uh, protest politics, which is very hard and very draining, not just out on the streets, but organizers, the amount of work that organizers are putting in to create these demonstrations um, uh, on the streets is, 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 is superhuman. I mean, it's, it's an incredible um, amount of just logistical um, support and maneuvering. Um, and it requires so much communication on their own parts, right? Like between all of themselves and the mitigation of all kinds of things in that. And then presenting that um, in the public, helping to keep people safe, helping to make sure that people have water, helping to make sure that, um, you know, people can be, you know, um, treated if they're pepper sprayed by police, you know, like all of that is on the, the backs of organizers. So built into the movement and from the very beginning, not starting right now, um, has been this um, focus on health and healing um, and being grounded and being centered. And there's all kinds of practices um, that come out of um, healing justice to help people deal with that. And it's still really hard. Um, in terms of uh, the importance of protest politics, you know, um, um, there's a reason why, as long as there have been democracies, there have also been social movements. It's because democracies require social movements. Otherwise, they devolve into uh, war or the polities end. Um, because, you know, Max Weber told us long ago, right, that all large, um, you know, institutions become self-serving rather than mission-serving over time. They just, they just do. Um, so the thing that saves democracy from that is the demand of the people who are the folks who actually authorize um, that is 
are the original authority for governance. Um, and elections are not enough to do that, right? Elections are a kind of a, a regular activity that we do in democracy, but they're not enough actually to create responsiveness once a system has become unresponsive and oligarchic. Uh, social movements have to do that. That's really, really interesting. I'm just gonna jump to another question um, from Danielle. Your idea of structural ills is interesting. In disability studies, we have a similar perspective called the social model of disability, which perceives disability as rooted in barriers and social structures. You know, uh, that is no ramp uh, to access to a building, only stairs, rather than disabled bodies. How can we shift the idea of care from the desi desire to fix or overlook marginalized bodies to the gaps and limitations in social structures and perceptions? Well, I think that the movement is doing that now and it is well studied and includes a lot of people from the disability justice movement. So one of the people who writes most eloquently about care and its place in the movement is Leah Lakshmi um, Paisna Samarashina, uh, who wrote a book called Care Work, um, who comes right out of the disability justice um, movement and frames things exactly as you say, um, is that um, if we have a care at the center of our politics, right? If it shapes the way we're thinking about how to govern, then we stop trying to fix individuals and we try to make society a place where people in all their different variety are able to live and thrive. That means they have access to all of the things that they need, um, that they um, are able to get treatment for um, the things that they need to be treated for, that they have leisure time, that they have enough uh, money, that they have health care, right? Like, so, um, you know, uh, a, a lot of, 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 of the politics of care draws from this, a disability justice framework in addition to um, feminist frameworks and black feminist frameworks. So it is a, is a kind of, um, you know, a hodgepodge, right? It, it is a philosophy that has learned um, from the movements that have come before it. There's a lot of good questions here, so I'm just going to keep going through them. Uh, Rob has a question about this notion of abolition. Um, if by abolitionism you mean no police or prisons, has any modern society ever experimented with having no prisons or police? If so, what were the results? Well, I don't think that we have any societies that have no prisons or police, but we have lots of societies that don't have very many police and very few people in prison. Um, so, um, you know, I think that abolitionists would, and, and those societies are very nice places to live, generally speaking. <laughs> um, you know, um, what they do is provide for the basic needs of their people, right? What they do is provide for the basic needs of their people as a matter of course. Um, and, um, and, and that matters. Uh, so, you know, I think that it's a kind of red herring a little bit to, um, to, to ask the abolitionists, so what happens if tomorrow we have no police in prisons? The abolitionist position isn't that tomorrow we have no police in prisons. The abolitionist position is that we have to try to create a society in which we don't need police in prisons. And the way that we do that is we start taking resources, the outsized resources, that we put toward punishment and put it toward care, okay? Um, and as we do that, we see that we have less need for police and prisons and we diminish um, their presence in the lives of the society um, in accordance with their lack of need. Sounds good to me. I mean, yeah, I think like the focus on like the word police or even prison here might be distracting insofar as if you look at Scandinavia, and you look at the role of what police do, they're occupying a completely different social role. And so to use the same word to refer to the social role that they play versus the social role that police are playing in America is almost to, you know, to risk uh, you know, equivocation or something. And same with prison. When you look at the kind of uh, you know, rehabilitatory um, function that, pr that prisons play, it's to uh, imagine a very different um, social institution. So I wonder, are they, I mean, just to follow up on this, like uh, what um, concretely, you know, what, what models do you take guidance from in this regard of, of, of different kinds of social institutions that you think that could better serve these goals of care and reducing harm? Well, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't know what you mean, what models that I take, um, 
uh, to be central. Um, I follow the work of abolitionists who have been working on this for decades, right? So I follow Miriam Kaba, I follow Ruthie Gilmore, I follow Beth Ritchie. Um, these are folks who, and others, right? These are folks who have been thinking through what abolition looks like um, for decades. Um, and, and at this moment, it's really very basic, right? Um, at this moment, it's really don't spend 30 to 50 percent of municipal budgets on police. Don't do it. You don't, you shouldn't do it, right? We're not spending 30 to 50 percent of our municipal budgets on making sure people are housed, fed, and educated. So why are we making, we're spending that on, on punishment? But why? Right? Like, so, so, so for me, like, you know, it's, I am not, um, and I do not hold myself out as a kind of guru of, uh, or scholar of abolition, right? I have been persuaded to this point through my research um, and, um, and I am particularly able to enter at this very pragmatic point of, I don't want to spend 50% of my municipal tax dollars putting people in jail, especially when the police kill people all the time, right? Uh, and they kill black people disproportionately. But they don't only kill black people and even the people they don't kill sometimes they ruin their lives right um by you know putting them through the criminal justice system uh, often for nonviolent things right a parking ticket can turn into an arrest warrant if you are too poor to pay the ticket that's the world we live in um i'm not okay with putting my tax dollars toward that i would much rather put my tax dollars toward educating people um, you know, educating the children in the community, making sure everyone is housed, making sure everyone has access to food. For me, this is just super basic. Um, and until we have sort of have moved past that point, I don't really um, want, I think that it's, it's premature to say, what does society look like if we have no police <laughs> in prisons? It's like, what does society look like if we spend half of our municipal budgets on feeding people and housing them and educating them? You know, at that point, then we can have that conversation. I think that's wonderfully put. This connects, uh, before this talk started, uh, Dave and I were talking about these issues and uh, we were talking about how one way to put this is in terms of reframing the debate about a budgetary issue. And I think it would be a, a tremendous progress to, to get people to think about it in those terms. And uh, so I really appreciate that. Um, well, and that's oh. why I have to say, plug for the movement right now, is that this is why defund the police is absolutely the right frame, despite the hand-wringing of so many people like, oh, no, it's going to put people off. No, it is absolutely the right frame because it points your attention towards budgets. And even people who are very nervous about the idea of not being able to call the police or people who trust the police still might be a little bit astonished by how budgets are spent um, and want to reallocate funds in different ways. That's great. Um, so I'm gonna, we're going to try an experiment. We're going to call on Liz. Uh, Liz, we're going to make your audio uh, live if you're, if you're there. Hi, I'm here. Great. Thanks. Can you ask your question? Hi. Uh, yes, New School alumni. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> in your section on um, the handout that you've given out, one section that stands out to me is when we're discussing violence. Um, and we're definitely known that there's <laughs> violence. Black men sometimes have violence towards um, black women. And a lot of times we'll probably keep that quiet because we want to advance things forward. Um, so we don't, what we say, um, leave all of the stuff out, the laundry out for everybody. We try right. to keep things in house. Now we're kind of looking at, um, I think that instead of patriarchy, which is definitely, um, we're looking at systems um, that are being dominating on people. Let's talk about toxic masculinity. And can we talk about toxic masculinity as the original sin? When we're looking at, since now, original sin of the country is coming up in terms of slavery, and all the horrific violence that was enacted towards black women and men and how that has been systematic going forward. Um, how do we see in terms of care that we can dismantle or that or begin to address that? Well, I mean, um, you know, I don't, um, 
I'm not interested in, in sort of like prioritizing the sins at the, <laughs> at the sort of inception uh, of modernity or, uh, or the American um, project, right? I think we have to deal with all of that. Um, I think that addressing toxic mas masculinity is really, really important, but I think it's absolutely a part of patriarchy, right? Like toxic mas masculinity is the affect of patriarchy, right? Like so, um, you know, uh, you know, this is why the framework of intersectionality is so important um, because it helps us to understand the ways in which oppressions can compound um, based on the identity categories that one occupies. Um, and so, black women um, uh, have to deal with uh, not only racism um, but the way that racism is gendered. Um, and um, they also have to deal with plain old sexism um, and misogyny um, directed and violence, right, um, directed um, at them for Black men. And so, um, you know, I appreciate the efforts um, that many people have undertaken to address toxic max, first name it, right, um, and then address it as an attitude. Um, but I'm actually, usually much more interested in um, systems. Um, so I, I, I am interested in changing people's attitudes, but usually not on an individual level. Um, I think that there's so much work to be done um, on our, con I think that so much of toxic masculinity is actually attached to capitalism and um, uh, how, um, maleness or masculinity is placed in in the sort of um, <clears throat> task list, right, uh, of of our economic system, um, and the frustrations that come from that, um, and um, the the willingness or wanting to define oneself um, in those terms. Um, I also think that toxic masculinity comes from a dearth of attention to the reinvention the reinvention of masculinities. So this is one thing that I think is really important for men to do. Like the movement always talks about the things that it's important for white people to do. Like it's white people, you need to educate yourselves about racism and, and, and get your people and, um, you know, uh, um, help them to understand what white supremacy is. I think that men have a lot of work to do on what masculinity is. Um, there is, um, you know, I can't, I don't know, uh, what, uh, positive masculinity is. Um, and I think that that's work that men need to, to do. Um, so, um, and I mean that like, not just interpersonal, like personally, right. But also like theoretically, um, like I have, I have readings to give my daughter and my son on feminism and femininity and, um, you know, um, patriarchy. Um, and, and we talk about those things all the time, but it's harder to talk about masculinity in those ways. And, and that's honestly work I think that men need to do. That's appreciated. Uh, Miranda, you uh, jump in here. Yeah, uh, hi, thank you, Diva. So this was um, excellent talk. I. Particularly, actually, I really appreciate the kind of like opening characterization of sort of the dual uh, dual qualities of radicality and pragmatism. Um, and I think in a certain way that characterization gets at the heart of like a lot of, uh, say, like some of these questions. Um, and that like the imagining new possibilities can be not only like simultaneous, but a product of like just actualizing practical concrete steps. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I thought, and, and a lot of my questions are actually like uh, uh, echoed by our audience. So I'm going to like turn to the audience again. There's some really good questions here. Yeah. Um, so Emma, um, Emma asks, I'm just going to read, uh, I'm, <coughs> seeing, I'm seeing some demands in this moment for community control, tactics like the establishment of autonomous zones. Does the movement theorize a particular role for the state in the provision of care. Yeah, and I think this is really interesting um, because you had <coughs> the state as taking over these responsibilities of care, um, but also these notions of community and sort of uh, reimagining community. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is a tension there, um, mm -hmm. but it's also because there's an ideological diversity within the movement, right? Like, so um, a lot of things about the movement it, 
for Black Lives are that um, it's a semi-federated kind of organization. And when I say that, I mean that localities really do have a lot of autonomy, um, you know, mm -hmm. to decide, uh, first assess um, issues that are going on there and decide what tasks they're going to take, what methods they're going to use, right, methods and tactics they're going to use and what their sort of answers are. So, um, you know, um, the idea of community control <clears throat> is really important, but community control also doesn't negate state responsibilities, right? Mm -hmm. So community control um, still acknowledges that there is a state, right? Um, and the state d may, you know, collect taxes and therefore distribute resources, but community control means that there is a participatory budgeting process where we have to approve where our resources go, um, where there are civilian oversight um, and input, um, you know, at every level, um, where we um, take as given that investment into the community and what's best for the community, um, as defined by the community, comes first and is, is bottom up and not top down. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not really an either or, it's a productive tension right there. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's also something that may differ by location, right? But by locality, um, there will be some zones that are more autonomous than others. Um, mm -hmm. But if we keep care at the center, that is, if we keep the improving of people's lived experience at the center, then mm -hmm. that is our guide, right? Not an abstract ideology. I see, yeah. And so if we kind of keep the value of care at the center of a kind of like dialectic, like a sort of back and forth between like the tensions of the state and the community, something like a better form of life emerges. Like, exactly. Like, yeah, that's, I mean, that's awesome. That's really interesting. So I'm gonna turn next, uh, Maya has a question that takes us in a slightly different direction, but I think it's an interesting one. She goes, thank you for your talk. Um, how does the movement for black lives, politics of care, um, how can it be translated uh, transnationally? So how would and can it work in other places with different notions of blackness and histories of racialized oppression? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's just yes to that one. Um, people in, organizers in the Movement for Black Lives have always thought of themselves as working on a global project, right? Um, that's why you capitalize the B in black because it names um, a, a diasporic ethnicity. Um, and so that means that blackness means different things in different places and organizers in the movement have actually gone, right, had delegations that go to Brazil and Palestine and New Zealand, and, I'm sorry, and Australia, right, um, and, you know, different places in Europe um, to understand what blackness is in those places, right, um, and to South Africa, right, like in Africa, just understand what blackness means in those places. Um, so this has always been an active interest of the movement to think transnationally while understanding that there's a high level of specificity right in different places with different historiographies um, but care no matter where you are um works well right <laughs> as a guide right like so um you know that's what's so so useful uh, about it is because if you are in the practice of centering the most marginalized that is the people who have the least ability demonstrated objective ability to live in sh and thrive in a particular society, then um, you're able to sort of move, move from there, right? Like you, you sort of move from that, that moment. Mm -hmm. There's a perfect follow-up question uh, to this from Deborah. Oh, no. Can you, can you hear me? Oh, no. But I'm here. I'm here. Oh, you are here. Okay, good. <laughs> oh, no. um, so Deborah has a perfect follow-up question to this, which is about the comparing and contrasting a politics of care with traditional human rights uh, discourse. So she asks, if I understand correctly, to think about the politics of care is significantly different from a traditional human rights perspective, even if it may lead to some similar struggles that is protecting life and dignity of all persons. Can you comment about some of the differences and similarities between the two? Yeah, absolutely. So this is part of what I was talking about when I was saying that the notion of rights is not an intermediary term, right? Between the human and the obligation to care, right? 
Um, and that's what makes it really different, right? Like, so because if you, you start, you're thinking about human rights, you're thinking about, um, well, which things count as natural rights, right? And how do we sort of like um, um, uh, delineate all of those things and make sure that we have declared, right, what is entailed in those rights, right? Like, so you like the UNH, you know, the, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for example, like which things get put in and then which are delineated and how can we base laws in that way? Um, whereas the politics of care does not move from the abstract um, to the, the particular. Instead, it moves from the lived experience, right, to the policy. Um, and that's really the, the difference because um, in the, you know, sort of under the philosophy of the politics of care, it doesn't matter whether or not your rights have been properly delineated if um, it's demonstrable that you're not able to live and thrive. Right, like, um, and this has been a huge problem in the kind of um, rights discourse as well, is that it gets sort of bogged down in these kind of like this, these like legal designations, like you know, um, you know, should we, can we include, um, you know, does this count as you know this kind of um, violation of rights? Uh, and the politics of care doesn't doesn't take doesn't take that tack at all. It says, okay, so we see that there's an individual and a population of individuals that are systematically and demonstrably un unable to become housed, right? They are systematically and demonstrably unable to, um, you know, live to a a, a, a human age that is, is sort of common and regular in modern society, right? Like um, that are systematically and demonstrably unable to have a level of health um, that is commensurate with what we know um, uh, is, is possible and actually should be standard in this moment. So it just takes a completely different perspective and it starts with people's lived experiences um, and their, their demonstrable capabilities um, uh, instead of starting from abstract uh, principles. That's really interesting. I mean, so an obvious follow-up question is, what about the capabilities approach that Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum have, right. you know, articulated? How does it relate to that? Well, I think it has some affinities. I mean, um, you know, I myself quite quite like the capabilities approach in theory, although the ways that it's applied um, uh, are sometimes distorted and prevent. Uh, uh, cause bad outcomes. But, um, you know, I think that there are definitely affinities with the capabilities approach, um, except that the politics of care um, allows itself to be kind of um, completely unlocked from a, a rights framework, right? Um, it's not that people don't have rights, um, they do have rights, right? And you can still have sort of a juridical framework. It's just not where the philosophy starts, right? Um, it has to start with capabilities. So, or it has to start with what people are able to do. Um, so the capabilities approach um, kind of gives you a back end. It says like, what are people's rights and are they actually able to exercise them? It's kind of a two-step process in that way. Um, whereas the politics of care um, just starts with people's lives. Does that make sense? Hold on, I had no audio. Yes. <laughs> um, so let's end on a final question. It's a very straightforward. I like uh, I like uh, straightforward questions. It's a bold question. It's from Mary. It's is the politics of care compatible with capitalism? Um, probably not. Right. Um, at least not as an overarching system. Now, look. Um, I think that you know. I think that we have uh, a lot of options in terms of uh, ways to arrange our economic system, right? Like, so um, I'm not a person who actually thinks that markets are never appropriate, right? Like that, um, that they are never a way to sort of like organize um, how we, you know, move goods around the world. However, capitalism as it exists today, right, as not only a way to move goods around the world, but a whole philosophy, right, like, um, that orders our entire lives, care can't, no, care is not compatible with that, right, because at the heart of what capitalism is, is um, profit, right, um, and that's where, that's what we see, right, in this, in the, in this moment, in this COVID era, the question has never been starker, what do we choose, right, what do we choose, do we choose reopening the economy or do we choose the protection of life and health, uh, particularly of the most vulnerable? 
and we see the choice that our executive has made, right? This administration has made, right? Um, and, so, and, and, and that's, that's stark and it's grave, right? Like it's, 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 it's a very, um, uh, perhaps not shocking, but still devastating. Um, I think it is becoming, yeah, it's, you know, this is making the, making it more starkly clear than perhaps ever before. On that uh, note, we'll, uh, I guess we have to end, but thank you so much for joining us. This was wonderful. And thanks to everybody else in the audience for joining us. This particularly vibrant question uh, period this time. So thanks everybody. And please join us again soon. We'll be back on Monday. So thank thanks you, to everybody. you. Everybody. Thanks for coming. Stay safe. Thank everyone. You,